good morning students so we are going to discuss today a brief note on uh, sexual reproduction in flowering plants so in the last class we had a brief note on uh, uh, reproduction in organism but today we are going to discuss uh, about the sexual repro reproduction in the flowering plants uh, it will be in the nutshell so it is only a, just a recap of whatever we have dealt in our regular classes okay so first of all we have to remember is uh, reproduction in the flowering plants is said to be sexual and the uh, organs that are involved in the sexual reproduction in the flowering plants are the flowers so what is a flower a flower is a modified shoot that is meant for sexual reproduction so when you look at a flowers you should recognize them as the reproductive parts of the plant body okay now when you see about the flower uh, the cultivation of the flower is called as or the cultivation of the flowering plants is called as the floriculture there are several hormones and structural changes that are uh, occurring in the plant body which leads to the differentiation of a, a common vegetative bud into the floral bud which you call it as the floral primordium okay what is primordium a primordium is any organ in its early stage of development the which will subsequently will develop into the main organ or maybe a main structure and a group of flowers generally are, are called as the inflorescence and inflorescences are formed uh, which the which bears the floral bud and then the flowers uh, in the flower there are male and the female reproductive structure the male structure is called as the androecium whereas the female structure is called as or the female sex organ is called as the gynecium they are well differentiated and they are well developed okay so these are some of the now uh, uh, if you see reproduction in our uh, reproduction in organism we have uh, studied sexual reproduction has got three events first one is the pre uh, fertilization event fertilization and the post fertilization event so in the pre fertilization event it is how the flower develops and the um, what you call it as the formation of the male and the female sex organs and as well as the formation of the male and the female sex organ so as a pre fertilization event so first let us study about the male uh, sex organ in the flower as we all know the female the male sex organ in the flower is the androecium the units of androecium are called as the stamens a stamen is a long slender stalk which has got the filament and then the anther okay right we know that this is a stamen right you can see here this is a stamen this is a filament whereas this is the anther the anther is connected to the filament with the help of a connective the proximal end of the filament is attached to the thalamus okay so this is the proximal uh, end of the filament will be attached to the thalamus okay and the length uh, of the filament varies in different flowers in the first year syllabus we have studied uh, about the different length of the filament okay so that is uh, the structure of the filament uh, i mean the structure of the stamen the main part of the stamen if you see is the anther okay so anther is the anthers are either dithecus or they are monothecus you should remember these terms in this particular chapter we come across many um, uh, what you call botanical terms or maybe you can say scientific terms now if you see dithecus dithecus here refers to where the anther uh, are said to be bilobed that is it has got uh, two lobes okay so each lobe has got two theca or it has got the two uh, what you call it as the pollen sac okay now you can see here so when you take the transverse section of the anther right there are two lobes these two lobes are are uh, the called as the anther lobe and each uh, lobe has got the pollen sac or it is also called as the microsporangia or microsporangium okay so now coming to the structure of the anther okay when you take the transverse section of the anther right we have to take the structure of the transverse section of the anther the transverse section of the anther appears like a butterfly shape right you can see here this is one lobe and this is another or this is one lobe and this is the another lobe and these are the megasporangium or what you call it as the pollen sac so when you enlarge one megasporangium right when you see an enlarge of the one mega gasporangium you are going to see the different parts of the uh, anther 
so the wall of the anther has been differentiated into four layers the outermost layer is called as the epidermis epidermis is mainly the part which will help in uh, protecting the anther from various mechanical injuries then inner to the epidermis you see is the endothelium endothelium plays a very important in the dehiscing of the anther because it is said to be hygroscopic it absorbs the water from the atmosphere and then it will help in dehiscing the anther once the anther is mature inner to the endothelium what you see is the middle layer around 2 to 3 layers of middle layers are present then inner to the uh, middle layer you see is the tapetum tapetum is a very important layer we know that the tapetum has got reserved food substances which will help in nourishing the uh, microspore cells that are found within the tapetum okay so thus these are the four layers of the anther when you take the transverse section of the anther it is important even it can be asked in the form of a diagram okay so uh, i have already i have explained you about the the you know the, the structure of the anther let me uh, uh, what you call uh, let me focus on the tapetum it nourishes the developing pollen grains the cells of the tapetum possess dense cytoplasm and generally have more than one nucleus nucleus divides without cytoplasm uh, uh, cytoplasmic divi division okay so as a result poly the tapetum is said to be polyploidy and plays a very important role uh, apart from the uh, nourishment okay so this is about the transverse section of the megasporangium or the transverse section of the pollen sac okay now coming to next is the microsporogenesis what is microsporogenesis microsporogenesis is a process during which microspores are produced by meiotic cell division from microspore mother cell okay the microspore mother cell are also called as the pollen mother cell okay you call that as the microsporogenesis microsporogenesis occurs within the anther inside the pollen sac okay there are the, there are many cells called as the uh, pollen mother cells and these uh, poll, pollen mother cells will undergo meiotic division to form the microspore tetrads which further will uh, separate and form the microspore or the pollen grain and this process you are calling it as the microsporogenesis okay so and you have to remember because microsporogenesis occurs in the microspore cells or the mother cells microspore mother cells you have to remember they are diploid they undergo meiotic cell division and produce the tetrads okay there are four haploid cells because they have undergone meiosis microspore tetrads are said to be haploid and these microspore uh, tetrads will separate and then form what called as the pollen grains okay and these pollen grains remember are also called as the microspore force okay so you have to remember when the anther matures dehydration and dissociation occurs and the tetrad cells will separate and as a result the pollen grains is produced this entire process you are calling it as the microsporogenesis let us let us see about the microspore uh, or the pollen grains what are pollen grains the pollen grains represents the male gametophytes okay the size the shape the color and design differs from one species to other species species fossils because because of the presence of the sporopollenin pollen grains can be fossilized because of the presence of a very hard substance called as the sporopollenin pollen grains can be preserved under minus uh, uh, 196 degree centigrade uh, uh, which you call it as a, a cryo preservation which is very important for crop breeding or plant breeding the pollen food and nutritious uh, the pollen grains are, are said to be nutritionally very high value as a result they are been used for the higher performance of the athletes as well as the uh, uh, race horses pollen grains are known to cause the pollen allergy okay some of the allergy that are caused by pollen grains is the bron bronchitis uh, asthma and as well as the rhinitis okay so some of the um, uh, species or maybe some plants which are known to cause the pollen grains of some species of the plants which are known to cause pollen all allergy are the parthenium 
okay the viability of pollen grains depends upon the temperature and humidity and we should know that pollen grains are viable for few minutes to even several months and as well as even several years also okay see you, you see here few uh, the some of the pollen grains are viable only for few minutes example is rice few of them are said to be viable for few months for example solanaceae then uh, rosaceae as well as uh, leguminaceae okay so uh, this was about the brief note about the pollen grains now coming to the structure of the pollen grain when you see the structure of the pollen grain remember pollen grain is said to be the male gametophyte as is no it is known to carry the male gametes the pollen grains have got first of all a wall two walls called as cell wall which is differentiated as the outer exine and the inner intine exine is said to be thick hard or ornamental made up of a sporopollenin which makes the them resistant to organic uh, substances uh, as well as it is said to be the most uh, resistant organic material on the earth and it is said to be resistant against high temperature acid as well as alkalis Uh, uh, the the exine has got the small openings they are called as the germ pore what does germ germ pore generally represents germ pore generally represents where there is no the exine present only the intine will be present and the germ pore has to be present why because the pollen tube emerges from the germ pore okay so you have to remember germ pore is the part or the aperture in the exine where there is no sporopollenin or the sporospollenin is generally absent in this particular region called as the germ pore next inner to the exine you find is the the intine okay intine is a, a thin walled and it is continuous layer it is made up of a cellulose as well as a pectin again these are some of the important questions that are asked in your competitive exam exine is made up of sporopollenin whereas the intine is made up of a cellulose as well as a pectin then apart from this the uh, sporopollenin is known to produce the pollen kit a uh, fat the substance okay right remember which generally helps in attracting the insects for pollination okay right so this is the structure of the pollen i mean the cell wall the structure of the cell wall of the pollen grains differentiated into exine and as well as the intine then inner to the exine and the intine what do you find especially inner to the exine time the cytoplasm the cytoplasm of the pollen grain is surrounded by the plasma membrane okay a mature pollen grain okay will uh, during the development of the microspore uh, mitosis remember it is said to be two two celled okay right when the pollen grains are generally shed right you see that or you can tell a matured pollen grain is said to be two celled yes students what are the two cells they are the vegetative cell which is also called as the tube cell it is a bigger cell has an abundant food reserve and has an irregular large irregular shaped nucleus so the vegetative uh, the vegetative cell you can see here is said to have a large nucleus whereas the second cell is called as the generative cell generative cell is generally seen it is said to be small it is spindle shaped with a dense cytoplasm and a nucleus it generally floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell as i have already told you around 60% of the angiosperm the pollen grains are been shed in the two celled stage okay and remaining you see that in some of the species of plants remember pollen grains are can be also be shed in the three celled what does this three celled stage refers to why the three celled stage here refers to where the generative cells uh, the generative cell will undergo one mitotic division resulting in the formation of two male gametes okay so two male gametes so thus the generative cell will divide mitotically producing two male gametes whereas the tube cell will help in producing the pollen tube so thus the pollen tube will help in carrying the two male gametes to the region where the egg cell is present for the process of fertilization so thus a pollen grain can be either shed uh, 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 pollinated either in the two celled stage or they can be even shed in the three celled stage so what are the three cells here 
two male gametes whereas one is the vegetative cell which is developed to form the uh, pollen tube so that was all about the male gam male uh, sex organ let us move on to the female sex organ what is the female sex organ called as the female sex organ is called as the gynecium gynecium is the male sex uh, sorry female sex organ it is called as the pistil okay the uh, 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 when you see in a flower gynecium is the innermost whorl okay the units of gynecium are called as the carpel each carpel has got a stigma style and the ovary right where the stigma forms the receptive surface of the um, carpel which helps in receiving uh, the pollen grains whereas the style is the long part of the um, uh, carpel which ba basically helps uh, for the growth of the pollen tube whereas uh, the swollen part part of the uh, right the swollen part of the gynecium you call it as the ovary ovary in inner to the ovary there are many ovules okay so all these ovules are attached to the inside of the ovary with the help of a tissue called as placenta okay so the ovary has got a cavity and the cavity of the ovary you call it as the locules it is inside the locules where you see the ovules okay so in the first year you have studied about the different types of placentation what is placentation it is the arrangement of the ovules in the inside of the ovary okay then the number of ovules uh, is either in in the ovary can be one or it can be many okay so example is wheat or paddy or mango or many is example is papaya watermelon orchids etc okay then a gynecium can has has only one carpel when a gynecium has one carpel you call it as monocarpellary when a gynecium has many carpels you refer it as multicarpellary when the carpels are fused you call it as sing carpels whereas when the carpels are free you call it as apocarpels that is when the pistils are fused either carpels or pistil when the pistils are fused you call it as sing carpels when the pistils are free you call it as the apocarpels again you need to remember the terms here okay next now uh, within the ovary the ovules are there and the ovules are in a different uh, position depending upon the position we can classify the ovules into different types so what are these different types of the uh, ovules so first of all if you see is the orthotropous in an orthotropous the micropyle the chalaza and the funicle are in the straight line can you see here this figure you see that the micropyle the chalaza and as well as the funicle they are said to be in the straight line second is the anatropous ovule in anatropous ovule the ovule turns at an 180 angle and thus it is an inverted ovule micropyle lies close to the hilum okay you can see here this is the micropyle it is lying close to the hilum or at the side of the hilum right anatropous ovule is said to be present in 90% of the angiosperm families then coming to the third one is the campylotropus okay so campylotropus is an ovule right where you see the ovule is curved more or less at a right angle to the funicle right so now this is the funicle and here is the uh, micropyle okay micropylar end is bent down straight uh, slightly example where do you find the campylotropus in the cruciferous then fourth one is the hemitrophus so hemitrophus ovule um, turns at 100 uh, around 90 degrees angle upon the funicle so this is the funicle and here you see the ovule has turned to 90 degrees so thus you see that it is at right angles to the funicle the body of the uh, ovule right the body of the ovule is said to be right angle to the funicle where do you find the hemitropous ovule hemitropous ovules are generally found in the family called as ranunculus all right or plant called as the ranunculus then coming to the fifth one is the amphitropous amphitropous this is the amphitropous ovule ovule as well as the embryo sac is curved like a horseshoe can you see here right it is completely curved like a horseshoe even the embryo sac also is curved okay you can see amphitropous ovule in case of lemna poppy as well as elsama okay so these are some of the 
what you call it as the types of uh, ovule last one is the circinotrophus uh, in a circinotrophus ovule the ovule turns more than 360 angles so the funicle comes becomes coiled around the ovule you can see the funicle has to or coiled around the ovule okay you can see the circinotrophus ovule in case of opentia that is cactaceae okay so these are the different types of the ovule now coming to the structure of the ovule very important question okay so if you see the structure of the ovule we are studying here is the anatropous ovule so uh, ovule is also called as the megasporangium okay microsporangium is the pollen sac whereas ovule is said to be the megasporangium so what are the different parts of a megasporangium or the ovule first of all you see is the funicle funicle forms the filament of the ovule it is the stalk of the ovule right you see that through which you see the ovule is attached to the placenta coming to the second part is the hilum the body of the ovule will fuse with the funicle at a particular region and this region is called as the hilum then third is the integument the ovule is covered by two protective envelopes called as the integument the outer and the inner integument then in order to the integuments so, uh, okay you need to remember integument at one end it is completely uh, covers the ovule uh, that part of the ovule where the integument is uh, completely covered you call it as the chalaza whereas at the other end or the other pole of the ovule there is a small opening and this opening you call it as the micropyle so thus remember what is micropyle the integuments leave a small opening at one end called as micropyle this micro pile will help in the entry of the pollen tube now we know what is chalaza i told you opposite to the micropylar end is the chalaza representing a basal part of the ovule and you need to remember here the integument are been covered completely then coming to the next part is the nucellus nucellus is the nutritive tissue that is present within the ovule it basically helps in nourishing the embryo sac now coming to the embryo sac embryo sac is called as the female gametophyte which is called as the male gametophyte students right it is the pollen grain pollen grains are called as the male gametophyte whereas embryo sac is called as the female gametophyte a female gametophyte or the embryo sac is said to be eight nucleated and seven celled okay so what are the different cells that you see one is the egg apparatus egg apparatus is present towards the micropylar end it has got two synergid cells and one egg cell okay two synergid cells and one egg cell so now here it is a three cells then there is a filiform apparatus present in the synergids which basically helps in guiding the pollen tube towards the egg then there are three antipodal cells that are present towards the chalazal end towards the chalazal end you find three antipodal cells so 3 plus 3 how many now six cells then there are two haploid uh, two cells are present in the center these two haploid cells that are present in the center uh, two haploid nuclei at the polar end below the egg apparatus remember they are called as the uh, what you call central cell and the central cell has got two polar nu uh, haploid nuclei so you have to remember and a typical embryo sac is said to be eight celled uh, uh, sorry uh, seven celled and eight nucleated there are eight nucleus whereas there are seven uh, celled okay now coming to next is the megasporogenesis what do you mean by megasporogenesis it is the formation of the megaspore uh, by the meiotic cell division of the megaspore mother cell megaspore mother cell is said to be diploid it undergoes a meiosis resulting in the formation of a four haploid cells now these are four haploid cells nally remember three will degenerate okay resulting in the formation of only one megaspore you need to remember the stu students here very much here 
during microspore all the four mi uh, microspores uh, in the tetrad will develop to form the uh, microspores or the pollen grains but during the megasporogenesis the four haploid cells that are present which are arranged in a linear they are called as the linear cells or the linear tetrads now out of these three will generate degenerate and only one becomes a functional thus during megasporogenesis only one functional megaspore is produced this fun one functional megaspore enlarges okay undergoes mitotic cell division to produce two nuclei the two nuclei move towards the opposite poles okay right remember this is nothing but it is the formation of the uh, gametophyte or the embryo sac okay now you can see here right this is the megaspore it divides okay they are giving rise to first dyads then giving rise to tetrads that are linearly arranged okay so three will generate and only one becomes a functional and this one functional cell uh, megaspore cell will further undergo mitotic division right look here first it divides mitotically to produce two cells two nuclei sorry right there is no wall formation and both the nuclei will move towards the opposite poles as soon as reach the opposite poles further they divide again mitotically to produce four four nuclei and these are four nuclei later develop a wall around them and now they form what called as the cells so thus now there are four cells towards the micropylar end and four cells towards the chalazal end okay so the four cells that are present towards the chalazal end will form the antipodal organize and form the antipodal cells right and the three cells that are present towards the micropylar they form the egg apparatus whereas the two two nuclei right they will move towards the center of the embryo sac and form one large central cell okay so this is about the development of the female gametophyte or what you call it as the embryo sac okay so embryo sac is very important you have to remember right that uh, um, uh, right embryo sac structure of the embryo sac you have to remember except the polar nuclei rest of all the cells that are present in the embryo sac are said to be haploid it is only the polar nuclei which are said to be diploid because under fertilization this becomes a very important aspect okay now let us move on to the next topic under sexual reproduction in flowering plants that is pollination what is pollination uh, you have to remember we are still in the pre fertilization event in the pre fertilization event if you remember first is the formation of the gametes that is gametogenesis whereas the second is the gamete transfer gametogenesis we have completed gametogenesis in case of the flowering plants includes what called as microsporogenesis and megasporogenesis as well as development of the male and the female gametophyte now coming to the second event under the pre fertilization that is pollination so what is a pollination pollination is the transfer of pollen grains right it is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma okay right from the anther to the stigma pollen grains are immotile so they cannot reach the stigma by themselves so hence they always depend upon external agents for their transfer or maybe for their transportation and as a result they depend upon the biotic and the abiotic factors for the pollination then now basically you see there are two types of pollination one is the self pollination other is the cross pollination students look here self pollination is also called as the autogamy in the self pollination the pollen grains are transferred from the anther to the stigma of the same flower okay whereas in cross pollination pollen grains are transferred from the anther to the stigma of another flower so cross pollination is also called as the autogamy me self pollination is called as the autogamy self pollination now okay so now self pollination uh, we have already seen the definition okay now let us see about the types okay so the uh, uh, the two types of self pollination are one is the autogamy whereas as the gynogamy okay so what is autogamy okay autogamy is where the pollen grains are are said to be transferred 
to the uh, to the stigma of the same flower okay it is a type of self pollen in which an intersexual or an in, or a perfect flower is pollinated by its own pollen grains means it has been transferred auto means self okay so it generally occurs in bisexual flowers pollen grains of the anther are transferred to the stigma of the same flower so you call that as the autogamy and in order to bring about autogamy there are two devices one is the homogamy in homogamy both the anther that is the andrisium and the gynecia they mature at the same time okay right you see that they generally mature at the same time and uh, if uh, the um, the if the pollination is occurring between the anther and the stigma of the chasmogamous or the open flower they are brought together right they bend and they fold so that they bring about self pollination the second device you see is the cleistogamy what is a cleistogamy right cleistogamy or refers to here is where the flowers are closed in order to bring about a self pollination the flowers will remain closed those flowers which do not open they are called as the cleistogamous flower so the growth of the stigma uh, brings the pollen grains in contact with the uh, with the stigma okay the growth of the style brings the pollen grains in contact with the stigma so pollination and seed setting are assured here and you don't require any pollinators as far as autogamy is concerned then coming to the next is the gynogamy what do you mean by gyte it is a type of pollination in which the pollen grains of one flower are transferred to the stigma of the another flower belonging to either the same plant that is the genetically similar plants okay so in gynogamy the flowers often show a modification similar to one found in the xenogamy or the cross pollen right you know means remember neighbor okay when the pollination is occurring between two flowers that are produced on the same plant you call it as the gynogamy cross pollination okay cross pollination basically involves xenogamy cross pollination is the transfer of the pollen grains from the anther of one flower to the stigma of the uh, genetically different uh, flower cross pollination is performed with the help of an external agents so what are the external agents which will help in pollination the external agents we can classify them as abiotic and biotic agents the abiotic agents basically includes wind and water when pollination is occurring with the help of wind you call it as anemophily and when uh, when pollination is occurring with the help of water you call it as hydrophily whereas pollination that occurs by biotic agents okay so uh, pollination that is occurring with the help of animals you call it as a zoophily so zoophily depending upon which animal will help in pollination we have different types like entomophily entomophily pollination occurs with the help of insects ornithophily pollination is occurring with the help of birds okay then chiraptrophily pollination occurs with the help of bats then uh, malacophily uh, pollination is occurring with the help of a snail then myrmecophily uh, pollination occurs with the help of uh, ants then ophiophily where the pollination occurs with the help of snakes so you see that different animals are been involved and accordingly we are classifying the different types of pollination students here again technical terms are important uh, as far as your competitive exam is concerned okay now first let us see anemophily here anemo means does not mean animals allah anemos means wind so it is the pollination that occurs with the help of wind so the plants which are pollinated with uh, with the help of wind are Uh, coconut palm date palm maize grasses can uh, cannabis so these are some of the plants which are been pollinated with the help of wind one of the best example is the maize okay so what are the characteristic of an anemophily plants or anemophilous plants anemophilous plants nally the flowers are colorless odorless and nectarless andre the flowers are not colored neither they are fragrant neither means they do not smell nor they do have the the nectar <laughs> second the pollen grains are very light okay they are very light they are small either winged or dusty or dry okay right you see that they are dusty and as well as they are dry non sticky and unwettable means they are unwet 
okay then the stigma is said to be hairy the stigma is said to be hairy okay now this is stigma uh, which is said to be hairy okay or uh, branched to catch the wind borne pollen grains why the stigma is said to be hairy it is mainly to trap the pollen grains then lastly the pollen grains are produced in large number why as there is wastage of uh, pollen grains okay maize is the best example that you can see okay right uh, in the maize cob you can see that silky um, thread like structures they are nothing but the stigma okay so feathery they often there the stigma becomes often feathery mainly to trap the uh, pollen grains coming to the next is the hydrophily okay hydrophily is the pollination that occurs with the help of water basically water uh, plants or maybe aquatic plants or maybe hydrophytes are pollinated with the help of water right you call that as hydrophily okay example is the zoaster whereas another is the vallisneria there are few plants which are also been pollinated with the help of insects even though being hydrophytes okay for example icornia icornia and all they produce colorful flowers uh, so hence they have been even though being aquatic even though being hydrophyte they are pollinated with the help of insects okay now what are the characters of an hydrophilus flower flowers are small and inconspicuous nectar and odor is absent pollen grains are light and unwettable okay due to the presence of mucilage generally pollen grains are very long thread like i mean very long ribbon like and they are generally covered by a, a mucilage coat which makes the pollen grains unwet okay so they are generally unwet even because they have to be present in the water the stigma is said to be long sticky but unwettable okay so these are the characteristics of a hydrophilus flowers now you see that there are two types of uh, um, uh, what you call hydrophily one is called as epihydrophily epihydrophily where you see pollination occurs on the surface of the water as in the case of vallisneria in vallisneria pollination is occurring on the surface of the water epi means above above the surface of the water pollination occurs in vallisneria vallisneria is known to exhibit a very unique type of pollination okay a vallisneria is said to be a, a, um, a it is said to be a dioecious plant there is a male plant and a female plant a male plant produces male inflorescence you can see here aspadix inflorescence and then releases a small minute male flowers which generally float on the surface of the water whereas the female flower plant is known to produce a female flower with a very long pedicel and this long pedicel will coil and uncoil during the process of pollination the long pedicel will uncoil and allow the female flower to reach the surface of the water due to the water current the male flower will reach the female flower and then pollinates but it is not occurring inside the water but pollination is occurring on the surface so it's called as epihydrophily hypohydrophily pollination occurs inside the water you call it as hypohydrophily ceratophyllum are known to show uh, uh, hypohydrophily where pollination is occurring in the inside the water so that was about the um, uh, hydrophily coming to the third is entomophily pollination that occurs with the help of insects the basically the insects that are involved in uh, pollination are moth butterfly then wasp bees beetles so these are some of the insects that will help in pollination okay some of the characteristic feature of an entomophilus flower the flowers are generally showy and brightly colored showy antandre they are very obvious brightly colored mainly to attract the insects then most insect pollinated flowers have got a, a, a landing platform they have got a landing platform the pollen grains are spiny heavy and surrounded by a yellow oily sticky substance called as the pollen kit okay right it is basically for attracting the insects then stigmas are often inserted and they are sticky then some flowers provide a safe place for the insects to lay the eggs example is the yucca okay so these are some of the characteristic feature of an entomophilus flower but you need to remember apart from the insects there are some um, 
arboreal animals which also help in pollination like the lizards okay so lizards and some of the primates that are that dwell on the tree also help in uh, pollination okay so this is how you see that uh, uh, through pollination the male uh, gametes will reach the the fem the female sex organ or maybe the female part of the flower to carry out the process of fertilization okay now uh remember cross pollination is said to be more advantageous over self pollination okay right it is said to be more advantageous over self pollination so hence majority of the plants remember they carry out a cross pollination so in order to ensure cross pollination or in order to um, uh, what uh, what you call it as ensure that allogamy uh, they have, the plants have got certain devices these devices are called as outbreeding devices let us briefly see about these outbreeding devices some of the outbreeding devices first is the dicogamy in dicogamy anther and stigma they mature at the different time in protandry remember it is the andrisium that matures the first and example is sunflower salvia in protogyn it is the gynisium that matures the first okay right you see that uh, you can see protogyn in some of the flowers like mirabilis julpa then gloriosa then uh, pentamogo right uh, pentago okay so like this remember dicogamy is the first device then coming to the second device second is is the hericogamy in a hericogamy you can see the bisexual flowers the male and the female sex organs are completely separated due to the presence of a barrier and the barrier will prevent the both the may, the sex that is the anther and the stigma to come close to each other and that pollinate and thus prevent self pollination the third device you see is the self sterility it is also called as a self incompatibility where the pollen grains of the same flower fail to germinate on the stigma of the same flower okay you call this as self sterility okay uh, about the self sterility we have all we have studied okay if pollen grains are s1 and s2 and even the um, what do you call it as this uh, the female sex organ are s1 and s2 that do not germinate okay so there is a compatibility between the pollen grains and as well as the female sex organ okay we have studied in our theory class uh, in detail about the self sterility then uh, then coming to the, uh, the fourth device heterostyly right in heterostyly you see that uh, there are two to three types of flowers with the different heights of the style and as well as the stamen especially the filament okay so first one is the heterostyly in heterostyly what do you find is diheterostyly where you see there are two type of flower one type of flower is called as the pin eyed where there are, in a pin eyed there is a long style and a short stamen whereas in the thrumb eyed the style is short whereas the stamens are long okay so that is hetero, that no, diheterostyly triheterostyly there are three types of flowers with the different heights of the style example is uh, lithrum okay lithrum is an example for the triheterostyly okay so pollination occurs between anther and the stigma of the same height present in the different flowers okay so that was about the devices uh, or you can tell the different devices that will help in cross pollination so briefly we see pollination two types of pollination self pollination cross pollination self pollination again two types autogamy gynogamy cross pollination as the xenogamy again for autogamy you have two devices called as the chasmogamy and clistogamy chasmogamous are those flowers which open clistogamous flowers are those which do not open remember for the examples for the clistogamous flowers uh, oxalis and as well as commulina they have produced two type of flowers one is the chasmogamous flowers which open this clistogamous flowers which do not open okay another example is even voila voila commonly called as the pansy okay so these are the three examples so for the flowers which have got both the chasmogamous as well as the clistogamous flowers okay now once the pollen grains are been shed on the stigma there is an interaction that is occurring between the pollen grains and the stigma you call this as the pollen pistil inter interaction okay so identification uh, okay identification of compatible or incompatible pollen grains by the 
stigma a dynamic process that in uh, that involves pollen recognition followed by the promotion or inhibition of the pollen okay this uh, uh, reaction or maybe this interaction that is seen between the pollen grains and the stigma it is basically because of the chemical that, that has been produced by both the pollen grain as well as the stigma especially it is the stigma which will enable uh, the pollen grain uh, uh, right to germinate on the stigma okay so the compatible pollen ac accepted by the stigma initiates the post pollination event okay that is the post pollination event okay now germ formation of the pollen tube through the germ pore now you see that once the pollen grains are been identified by the stigma the pollen grain will start germinating to produce the pollen tube right so as the pollen tube grows remember it grows through the stigma style and reaches the ovary the pollen grain which is said to be now two celled condition that is vegetative and degenerate the generative cell divides and produces two male gametes we have already seen okay so during the growth of the pollen tube in the stigma so now three celled condition pollen tube carries the two male gametes from the beginning as soon as the pollen tube after reaching the ovary enters the ovule through the through the micropyle and then enters uh, uh, through one of the synergids so through the filiform apparatus for the further fertilization okay right so that is pollen pistil interaction okay now you see that there is a process of artificial hybridization what does of artificial hybridization here refers to it refers to the crop improvement right where you see that artificially the plants are being uh, crossed okay uh, depending upon uh, the desired uh, pollen grains or maybe the pollen grains of your selection okay and the stigma has been protected from contamination okay now artificial in uh, artificial hybridization involves a two uh, steps one is emasculation in emasculation the female parent bears bisexual flower and hence you see the anthers are been removed uh, why the anthers are removed so that to prevent self pollination basically they are been removed uh, before the anther dehyzes using forcep okay there are different methods but generally you see with the help of forcep and then bagging emasculated flowers have to be now covered with a bag uh, of suitable size generally made up of a butter paper to prevent the contamination of the stigma with the unwanted pollen grains okay so once when they are been then the pollen grains are dusted on the a stigma or the pollen grains desired pollen grains they are dusted on the stigma and once again they have been rebagged okay so this process you are calling it as the artificial uh, hybridization so now let us move on to the second step under sexual reproduction uh, in flowering plants that is fertilization now fertilization in case of flowering plants is said to be double fertilization okay why is it called as double fertilization okay it is referred as a double fertilization because the uh, pollen tube will release two male gametes into the cytoplasm of the synergids right and uh, one of the male gamete will uh, will fuse with the zygo oh, sorry egg cell to form the diploid zygote you call this as syngamy whereas the another male gamete will fuse with the polar uh, nuclei or the central cell to produce a triploid cell called as uh, the Mm, uh, 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 referred uh, right it is referred as the primary endosperm nucleus this is cell uh, this central cell thus you see that the central cell is formed primary endosperm cell uh, develops into endosperm okay now comes is the question is about the entry of the pollen tube how does the pollen tube enter the pollen tube either enters through the micropyle or it may even enter through the chalaza okay so depending on that we have different types of pollen tube entry porogamy when the pollen tube enters through micropyle porogamy when the pollen tube is entering through the chalazal and chalazogamy when the pollen tube enters either through funicle or through the integument you call it as the mesogamy okay so you see here one of the male gamete is fusing with the egg cell to form the zygote whereas another male gamete fusing with the uh, Now, what do you call it as endosperm or the polar nuclei or the central cell forming the primary endosperm nucleus okay so that is because the 
two male gametes are involved in fertilizing the two cells of the embryo sac it is called as double fertilization and double fertilization is said to be very unique especially only to the angiosperms okay right angiosperms are known to exhibit double fertilization okay right you have to remember as a result of double fertilization there are two uh, what do you call it as uh, um, products are formed one is the embryo that is from the zygote whereas second one is the endosperm which is developing from the primary endosperm nucleus okay so now let us move on to the third unit uh, i mean the third event the third event is called as the post fertilization event okay after double fertilization event of the endosperms right remember endosperm and embryo will be formed okay so before embryo is a formed endosperm will be formed hence post fertilization involves three important events one is the endosperm development second embryo journey that is embryo formation whereas third is the seed formation endosperm development primary endosperm nucleus which is triploid which is formed as a result of the tri triple fusion will develop to form the endosperm endosperms are filled with the reserved food material so which will help in nourishing the, the embryo Dep uh, uh, depending upon right you see that okay uh, we'll see about the seed form the endosperm nucleus divides repeatedly and form the endosperm okay the uh, the seeds are called as endospermic seeds this endosperm acts as a, a food store for the developing seed example is the maize okay now depending upon the mode of formation of the endosperm right remember there are three types of endosperms one is the nuclear in nuclear the primary endosperm nucleus divides successively uh, to produce many free nuclei without any wall formation cell wall formation is not seen okay so it's called as the nuclear okay very nuclear okay the um, the tender water that is present in the tender coconut remember is an example for nuclear in cellular the first and the subsequent division is followed by the cell wall formation cell wall is formed after each nucleus division okay so it results in the formation of a cellular form of endosperm which is seen in the pulp of the coconut the pulp of the coconut is said to be cellular in helobial okay and castor is another example for cellular in helobial in between the two uh, about two nuclei there will be a transverse wall formation that is present towards the micropyle as well as a chalaza okay so thus remember uh, there are two three types of endosperm formation nuclear cellular and helobial now coming to embryogeny what is embryogeny it is nothing but embryo formation okay and embryo formation remains similar in both the monocot as well as the dicot embryo development uh, embryo develops micropylar end generally it develops towards the micropylar end of the embryo sac where the zygote is situated okay right you see that first endosperm will be formed and then later the zygote why because the endosperm will help in nourishing the developing embryo okay now the zygote will divide to form the pro embryo right two celled right one is the uh, so the first division transverse division two cells towards the micropylar end one is the embryo cell and another is the terminal cell or the other one you call it as the basal cell or it is also called as the suspensor cell okay so the terminal cell this is the terminal this is the basal cell next okay a suspensor cell will be formed the embryo cell will divide okay uh, undergo 6 to 10 cells undergo cell division to form 6 to 10 cells leading to the formation of a suspensor okay and hostoria okay so remember hostorium is the lower most part hypophysis to the root tip and as well as the root cap embryo cell will divide vertically at right angles to one another resulting in the formation of four cells okay then eight cells okay right which results in the formation of the plumule okay the pro embryo is undifferentiated glo glo then uh, the globular to the heart shaped and then to the maturity okay so that was about the development of the embryo now coming to the next is uh, right we have already finished in our theory We, uh, it is only just a synopsis so i am just dealing with the main highlighting parts okay 
so remember pro embryo pro embryo in the heart shape heart shape in the matured embryo a matured embryo will get differentiated into a lower part called as the radical whereas the upper part called as the plumule okay now coming to the structure of the embryo the structure of a dicot embryo is different from monocot embryo very important again with the with the help of diagram even including diagram okay a dicot embryo consists of an embryo axis and cotyledon these are the two cotyledon these are the two embryo axis okay the portion of the embryo axis above the level of the cotyledon you call it as the epicotyl which further develops to form the plumule okay and the plumule will develop to form the shoot system whereas the part which is found below the cotyledons you call it as the uh, hypocotyl hypocotyl will develop to form the radical and the radical will further develop to form the shoot system the root tip has been covered by a root cap this is the structure of a dicot embryo structure of monocot embryo is slightly uh, complicated okay it is generally found in the grass family maize and all are the examples right you see that in case of uh, monocot uh, monocot have got a single cotyledon and this single cotyledon you call it as a scutellum okay situated towards one side of the embryo axis okay at its lower end the embryo axis has a radical it has a radical uh, and a root cap right covered by a root cap enclosed in an undifferentiated sheet called as the coleoriza andre the radical is been covered by coleoriza the portion of the embryo axis above the uh, attachment of the scutellum right is called as the epicotyl epicotyl uh, has a shoot apex and has a few leaf primordials shoot apex and few leaf modules okay uh, is a hollow foliar structure right it is covered by a sheath called as the coleoptile students you have to remember here about the coleoptile and the coleoriza okay next is about the seed formation remember a seed with the endosperm are said to be endospermic endosperm could reserve for the development of the embryo okay this is the embryo resulting in the formation of plumule radical as well as cotyledon okay then there is a uh, micropyle mainly for the entry of the oxygen and as well as for the water for the germination of the seed okay non endospermic seeds so those seeds which not have the endosperm why because the endosperm will be absorbed by the developing embryo the seeds are said to be non endospermic so thus two type of seed endospermic non endospermic endospermic seeds are called as albuminous non endospermic seeds are called as non albuminous okay bean pea and groundnut are the examples okay so i have already told you about the endospermic seeds so here is a, uh, you can see this is non endospermic seed whereas this is endospermic seed beans and this is a maize example yellow part what you are saying is the endosperm the remnant of the nucleus which persist in the seed and this residual of the persistent nucleus which is present is called as a perisperm and example for the perisperm is the black pepper and as well as in the beet so thus the post fertilization changes that you see in case of the uh, flowering plants are integuments will develop to form the seed coat micropyle will develop to form the seed pore the uh, ovules will develop to form the seed ovary will develop to form the fruit whereas the wall of the ovary will develop to form the pericard okay what about the ovary then after fertilization the ovary will develop to form the fruit so we have three types of fruit a fruit which develops from the ovary after fertilization is called as a true fruit a fruit that develops uh, from any other part of the flower other than the ovary you call it as the false fruit okay especially thalamus example apple apple is one of the best example for false fruit other fruits are strawberry as well as cashew nut parthenocarpic fruit the fruit which develops without fertilization is called as parthenocarpic and example for this is banana okay right so induced parthenocarpy uh, can uh, parthenocarpy can be par parthenocarpy can be induced by using certain growth hormones like auxin and as well as gibberellins especially to produce a seedless grape, grapes okay then coming to apomixis what do you mean by apomixis seed that is formed without fertilization especially in the grasses you call it as apomixis three types of apomixis non recurrent recurrent and advantive in case of non recurrent normal embryo sac is produced 
but the haploid egg will directly develop to form the embryo. Sterile plants are produced. In recurrent, there will be no meiosis. Hagagi diploid nuclei in the embryo. Okay, Hagagi, you see that directly the um, the egg which is said to be diploid will result in the formation of a diploid embryo. Then advantage um, uh, embryony, or it is also called as a sporophytic budding. Here, the embryo will develop from the other part of the um, ovule, like the nucellus or the integuments. That you call it as the apomix. Okay, then coming to the next one is the polyembryony. Polyembryony is a condition where you see that more than one embryo are present in the seed. Right, so example for this is mango as well as the citrus. Okay, uh, zygote pro embryo into two, uh, that is more than two embryo will be produced. The embryos will be produced from the other part of the embryo sac, such as the synagogues or the anti antipodal cells. But formation of an embryo from the antipodal cell is very rare. Even the cells of the nucellus as well as integuments also will develop to form the embryo. Okay, so example mango and citrus. So that is a multiple embryo sac in ovule that is all are fertilized. So this is all about the brief synopsis about the sexual reproduction in flowering plants hope students this will uh, uh, help you all uh, to at least attempt a few of the questions that appear from this particular chapter thank you